I will talk about today. Everything. It's just right here. I will just talk about it again and again and again and again. Okay, so humans are oriented towards social interaction. Okay. Uh, I think he's easy. You all understand? Yeah? Okay. Oriented to lean towards social interaction. Okay. Imitation and mimicry. Everyone understands imitation and mimicry? Mimic, imitate, same. Go oh, good. Oh. Okay, imitation, mimicry, um, promote social interaction. And and this is it's not just children imitating adults. We imitate each other. Okay? Um, you'll maybe see you'll see young men. Young men will they will be alone and he'll be very nice, but then when he's with his friends, he's like <laughs> Right? Okay? Is that we take on, we imitate each other, okay, when we get together in groups. We change our behaviors and things like that to, to meet everyone else's behaviors as well, okay? So, imitation and mimicry promotes social interaction. It allows us these kinds of abilities, to, these bonds, these social connections. They increase our emotional connectedness, okay? Imitation and mimicry, they increase our social and our emotional connectedness with other people, and they enhance empathy. We will see how. We will see how all this happens. Try to. Neural mirroring. Everyone understands neural. It's an adjective for neuron, neuron. Okay, neuron. Mirroring. Everyone understands mirror. Okay. I. You don't. You don't understand. Okay. I. That's okay. You don't understand. It's the same. Right. Anyways. The process of writing will help you understand. So say, everyone should, you should already be finished writing all of this. You need to take notes on everything. Chingu, Kali Siseo. Hey. Where? Where it says notes. That's that sentence? All of them. I gave you five lines. One, two, three, four, five. There are five checks. One, two, three. Okay. You're smart people, you can do the math. Five equals five. Okay? Neural, we will talk about this. Neural mirroring makes understanding other minds, i.e. intersubjectivity, possible. And we need to be able to understand other people's minds. So we'll try to talk about why. And why that's important. Okay? Again, I know you don't know this word. It's okay. Write it down. As you write it, and write it again, and write it again, and you begin to understand it. Okay? Intersubjectivity allows us to understand the emotions and intentions of others. <clears throat> I'll try to explain more. a little bit. Just write it down. Make it tell you make it. Coordination, does everyone know the word coordinate? To coordinate something? Maybe you have a you have a schedule, your friend has a schedule, and together you coordinate your schedule, you kind of like again same time that you can come together. Okay, so we coordinate. The coordination of attentional, okay, attention. Everyone look at me. Look at me, okay? Attention, I'm bringing your attention to me. Attentional, okay? Intentional. Why, why am I drinking? Excellent, that is intentional. Why, why we do something, okay? Intentional, why we do something, intentional. So, coordination of attentional and intentional behavior is the basis for culture and allows symbols to gain meaning. We're talking about our culture, okay? Our civilization needs this coordination of attentional and intentional behavior. I will talk about it. Don't worry, just quickly write. Oh, oh yeah, well, you guys gotta write faster. Maybe at the end I'll go back and you can write down again later. Look at your partner. We didn't talk to other people. Okay, what I'd like you to do first.
first. Okay, we're just going to look at this picture here. Okay, and when I look at you, and right now many of you are smiling. Okay, not all of you. Some of you have problems, but most all of you are smiling right now. Okay, when you look at this picture, you smile, and that's natural. It's part of what it is. It's part of being human. In fact, when when I smile at you. Okay? When I smile, it's difficult for you not to smile. It's actually very natural for you to respond to me with a smile. It's very natural. And we will talk about why that's natural and why it's important. Okay? It's actually very important. I mean, people who probably don't smile back, maybe they have some sort of problem. I don't know. Okay? When we look at this word, Okay? This word is just a set of symbols. Okay? We have the H, or a set of letters, right? H, A, P, P, Y. And when these symbols come together, particularly within a context, okay, when these symbols come together, it has meaning. You understand this word? Everyone understands this word? Or the Korean word, or something like that? Okay. <laughs> When Damon then says, when I say, I'm happy, I'm happy, you can understand me? How? How can you know what I mean? We are not connected with like a, um, a uh, I don't know, like some kind of electrical circuit. <laughs> Okay, we're not connected together like that. How can you understand what I mean when I say happy? Can you see happy? No. Yes, no, yeah, that's not a simple question. Yeah, it's not, it's a difficult question. It's not the same as like marker, right? Marker, okay, that's something that's very physical, whereas happy is an emotion. How can you understand, how can you understand this word? How can these symbols have any meaning for you? How is it when Damon says, I'm happy that you can understand? How can the set of symbols have any meaning for you? It's really amazing. So today, today's uh, topic, today's topic is the basics of language acquisition. And here, when I say basics, I mean real basics. We're looking at the very basics. Okay, this is week two on your sheet. So language is a highly complex, is highly complex and diverse. Okay, Korean and Portuguese and Swahili are all very different languages. Okay, they're all they're all very difficult. Okay, and language changes over time. Right? If I say chadonam, <laughs> you all understand. Yes. But if I said Chadunam 100 years ago, none of you understand. Okay? Language is changing over time. It's all very complex, it's very diverse, and changes. And yet, all children, right, with few exceptions, all humans are able to acquire language from a very young age. This is amazing. This, this blows my mind, literally. Okay? Not literally. How are humans able to acquire language? And we're going to focus on the real basics. We're going to, let's begin at the most basic level. Okay, I'm not going to give you any grand ideas. These will be very simple ideas. Basics. The basic for language acquisition at the very core is social interaction. We need social interaction for language, right? Think simply, right? If, if there are no other people, do you need language? No. Okay. So actually, this idea, social interaction is actually going to end up driving the foundations of language and culture. Humans are naturally inclined towards social interaction. A baby is born. What does the baby want? Food. What else? Wants love. Absolutely. It wants to be held. It gets good feelings, it gets good endorphins, okay, when a baby is held, okay? That is a social interaction right there. From the very beginning, we are very oriented towards social interaction. 
okay? Imitation and mimicry promote social interaction. And this is, this is not only children imitating adults. It's not just, I am the father, my son, he imitates me. It's not just that. Also, I imitate him. In fact, research by Vidal, adults tend to imitate, imitate the expressions and gestures of infants. So it's not just one direction. It's not just from adult to child. It's also from the child to the adult as well, or older brother to younger brother, and younger brother to older brother, or older sister to younger brother, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So we have this social interaction. Imitation and mimicry promote social interaction. This is uh, uh, Dr. Meltzoff out of the University of Washington. This is published years ago. Even from a very young age, I don't remember, maybe two or three months old, infants will imitate the facial expressions of the adults from a very young age. Okay? And at this, in the imitation, the process of imitating, we're actually bonding together. What, why? Why do, why do fathers, why do they look at their baby and go, well, part of what the father's doing is the father's imitating the child. The child is... The father. Okay, we're, connect, we're connecting, we're making a very strong social bond through that, through that behavior, through that imitation and mimicry. And this increases the connectedness and enhances empathy okay, between the two people, two individuals. Empathy. Everyone, do, do you all understand the word empathy? Because many of the students so far, they, they don't really know the word empathy. And this is very important that you understand this word. So what is the word maybe in Korean? Anyone? Okay. The Latin base is M, which means in. Pathos, pathy, is feeling or emotion. So this is our ability to when someone else has an emotion, that we are able to go inside their emotion. We're able to go inside their body and be able to experience and feel their emotion. Okay? Empathy is the ability, again, you guys, everybody, you all should be writing all the time. We're like, we're gonna try to be like American university students and actually take notes. Okay? Empathy is the ability to recognize and share emotions that are experienced by another being. When your friend feels sad, how do you feel? When your friend is happy, how do you feel? When I say the word happy, how do you feel? When I say the word sad, how do you feel? Okay? Empathy is this ability to recognize and share emotions. This is very important to language. This is very important to culture. It's a very important part of being human, what it means to be alive, to be human. I know, I know. You think, oh, Damon, Damon is playing, playing with our emotions, like Steven Spielberg. Yes, I am. Okay. I'm showing you these pictures because I want you to have an emotional reaction. I want you to have an emotional feeling right now. When you look at this child, this child who is very hungry, this child who is eating some kind of food off of the ground, these children in the possibly mothers who are crying and are very sad. When you look at these pictures, you have an emotional feeling. And you should have an emotional feeling. It's very natural. It's very part of what it is to be human for when you see these, for you to have an emotional feeling. If you didn't have an emotional feeling when you see this, maybe you have emotional problems. Wait, you're, you're, I think you're very, much, you're very correct. I think, I, I, and I, I haven't read the research, but I think, I think that the research supports that. Okay, is that there are psychopaths do end up having problems with their ability to feel empathy 
for other animals and for other people. Okay? And so this is, this is an emotional and psychological bond that connects us at a very basic level. Very basic level, like DNA. DNA is just the bonding of basically four molecules, or four elements. I can't remember their names, okay? And from these very basic bonds in our DNA, it, we're able to form much more complex uh, structures, chemical structures that just result from these very simple bonds in our DNA. The same with empathy. Empathy is a very simple bond between people, and it allows for much more complex things to grow out of that. And this bond can even extend to fictional beings. These are pictures from movies. And yet when you watch a movie, sometimes you cry, sometimes you laugh, sometimes your heart beats, sometimes you are afraid, but you know it's not real. You know it's just acting. But at the same time, though, you are able to empathize, to feel empathy with the characters in a story. Maybe some of the books you read in class. Also, it can extend between species, particularly social mammals. We are able to understand, at some level, some level we're able to understand the feelings and emotions of other species through ourselves. And it is very natural. In fact, this I, baboons, this Joy reminded me about this, and I was really happy she reminded me about this, is that baboons, these are baboons, is that when a big male, a big alpha male baboon, will sometimes attack a small male, and hurt the small male. And after the small male has been attacked and hurt, sometimes, or often, the females will come and groom the male after he's hurt. Why? Why do you think the females do that? They feel, they feel sad. They can understand, they can understand the feelings, the possible emotional feelings that the young, smaller baboon feels. Why is that important? Why is that important for us to understand what other, other people feel? Well, it's usually a good skin oh. Exactly. Excellent. Is that together, through these social interactions, we can overcome things that are bigger than us. Again, a cheetah probably is larger and stronger than baboons. Cheetahs eat baboons. But together, the, the baboons can chase away the cheetah. We can do things that are greater than ourselves. And this absolutely is about language. It allows us language and allows us this wonderful, beautiful culture and civilization that we have. Okay? It allows us to build buildings and make networks. You can't do that by yourself. Okay? Now, I'm going to just use a technical term, okay? I'm sorry. Intersubjectivity, empathy, empathy, all right? They're basically the same, okay? Intersubjectivity is just a more technical term used in psychology and linguistics, okay? So in psychology, intersubjectivity refers to the sharing of a subjective, emotional, or psychological state. Inter means between. Subject or subjectivity, two subjects are able to share an emotional or psychological state. When we laugh together, that's intersubjectivity. Okay? We're able to understand other people's minds and we're able to share in other people's minds. And this is very important. Sure, the meaning, not the meaning of what is What is language? expression to, to share your opinions or feelings with other people. So notice, look at those similarities there, right? Empathy, the sharing of feelings and emotions, but that's non-linguistic. What is language? Language is 
the abil our ability to share our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, our ideas, although to share our thoughts and ideas we need to have language. Okay? So, excellent. Very good, Ian. I think, I think your answer is going to be great. <laughs> always. It's unfortunate for her that's like the only student's name I remember in this class, so I'm just going to always, every time, always call her name. Okay, we've got to move on. So, how is this possible? When we think about empathy or intersubjectivity, it is necessary. Well, how is it possible? Da, da, da. Of course, Damon wants to talk about mirror neurons. Okay, this is a little difficult, okay? And enjoy at any point that you want to, to like interject, no, sure. great, okay? Um, so, mirror neurons, okay? These are neurons inside of our brain, okay? They are basically only in two areas of our brain. These two areas are areas connected to our body, okay? So we're just talking about the body. When I move, okay, I'm moving, part of my brain is active to help me move, okay? That part of the brain is called the motor, the motor cortex. Again, probably, hopefully, many of you are taking notes. It's called the motor cortex, right here is the primary motor cortex, okay? The motor cortex, M-O-T-O-R-C-O-R-T-E-X, the motor cortex is the part of the brain connected with moving, moving our body. Okay? I'm moving my body, I'm moving my body even more. Yeah, I'm a good dancer, huh? Okay. That's the, that's the motor cortex. Okay? We have mirror neurons inside of the motor cortex. Okay? We also have mirror neurons in this region, which is called the parietal lobe, particularly in the somatosensory cortex, okay? And in this part, this region here, we have areas that are connected with our senses, particularly touch, okay? When I feel something, everyone, everyone do this. Move your hand like this, okay, that's motor cortex. You go like this, oh, actually to your partner, go to your partner and do this, pinch. <laughs> okay, now when you're feeling, you're feeling that pinch, that's part of this part, this region right here. These are the two areas where we have mirror neurons. Okay, in these two areas. Part for moving our body, the part for feeling our body. Okay? Now, we're going to look at an executed reaching. Just this, Here, reaching is just simple, okay? Watch, Damon. Everyone watch me, okay? I'm going to reach, I reach, and I'm going to grasp something, okay? So, I'm reaching, that's a movement, that's a motion, that's the motor cortex, and I'm also touching, okay? I'm reaching and grasping so that I have a feeling, I'm feeling this beautiful pencil case, okay? Yes, it is very beautiful, okay? So, right here, this is our motor cortex, so this happens to be a motor cortex. Right? Okay, we have the motor cortex is active when I'm reaching. Also, this region is active when I'm touching. Okay, so I'm, I'm reaching, I'm touching. Okay, this part right down here, this is our visual, this is our visual cortex. Of course, I'm also looking at the same time. Okay, now here, this is a different person or someone else and they are not reaching. They are just not moving, okay? Just watching, just watching. Now, you can see that they, the, part, the part of our brain that is for seeing, the, the visual cortex, is very active. This person is not moving, or this part of the brain is not moving, okay? But notice this part of the brain that is connected with feeling, when you feel something, is active. Also, this part of the brain, which is our motor cortex, which is for moving, is active. This person is not moving. This person is not feeling. But in their brain, 
they are moving, and in their brain they are feeling. When they watch, when they watch someone else move and grab. What does that mean? Anyone tell me what that means? Okay, excellent. We, when we see someone do something, we imagine it or recreate it in our own brain. And that's how we understand it. Because we have to understand it through our body. Okay? So for us to understand other people's actions, other people's behaviors, we recreate in our own brain. So if you watch Damon jump, you just jumped inside your head with your own body and the feelings of what I did. You recreate it as best you can. Okay? As best you can. Okay? I'll try to make this part. So this is the, so we have our mirror neuron system, okay, which is our physical body recreating things, okay? Empathy, now let's connect this with empathy. Empathy depends upon the interaction between mirror neurons, which is again our body, moving and feeling of our body, and the limbic system. The limbic system is here, and it's, our limbic system is very connected with emotions. Okay, so we have these regions, these particular regions right here where we have mirror neurons, okay, and they're also connected up here and up here, here, okay. They're active, but then when we do something, okay, when we do something, you recreate it, but there's also an emotion connected to it. For example, Okay? You recreate it inside your head, but there's also an emotion with this. Okay? So you recreate that. It is also very connected with our limbic system, which is our emotional system. So every action that we have also is connected with emotions. And this limbic system, by the way, this system is what puts the hormones into our body. Okay? Uh, well, at least it's connected to the pituitary gland, which puts hormones into our body. Everyone knows hormones? Estrogen, testosterone, whatever. Okay? So we end up finding is that for empathy, we have these mirror neurons. Their activities are then connected with our emotional system, and from that we get empathy. Now I want you to think of some examples of a mirrored response, okay? And a mirrored response would be something that, that happens to, for example, someone else, right? Ah. Oh, ouch. Not the same reaction I got from my last no. class, yeah? Every, last class, everyone was like, <gasps> in this class, nobody cares about me. <laughs> <laughs> no empathy for me. <laughs> <laughs> They're all about joy. <laughs> like, can they stop talking? <laughs> Alright, so a mirrored response. Okay, I want you to think about what is a mirrored response? I just tried to think. Damon, could we maybe give a couple examples together with the class before they make their own? Before they move on? Oh, yeah. before, they... Oh, before they write their own? Sure. Maybe? Sure. Um, yeah, can you guys think of any examples of this mirrored response before we make our own? Can you think of any examples just right now of any mirrored response? Do you understand mirrored response? Yes. Yeah, it means you feel the same thing, right? So can you think of any examples right now? Demo. And then what do you mean? When I eat demo. Uh-huh. Or open by <laughs>
sometimes you can feel like chills on your back or something. Yeah, that's that kind of mirror response, right? So now with your partner, talk about and write a couple, write just one, one example of a mirror response. You can't say it, Levin, that was the best one. <laughs> about the opposite of like a mirrored response is that sometimes uh, this is, I have one friend he loves to watch soccer okay, and and sometimes he had his favorite team is Arsenal okay and when Arsenal is playing another team and a other team player gets hurt he will go yeah that's a kind of opposite right why 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 does that happen and that's just an interesting that's just something interesting to think about what kind of conditions, what kind of situations lead us to not share empathy with other people? And because it's kind of almost dangerous, but also kind of tribal in a way, um, to do that. So, the, and, and yeah, also probably just like misunderstandings and disagreements uh, result out of a lot of these lacks of, lacks of, lack of empathy. Okay, so why is inner subjectivity important? Okay, intersubjectivity has multiple effects. I'm just gonna. It, it inclines us toward imitative behaviors. Okay? Again, just with you and your friends, okay? You're, you're happy and you say, come bay, or come by, or something like that. And your other friends go, ah. Okay? You all are the imitative behaviors. When you're around your friends, you're kind of like, okay? You act, you take on, and that's okay. Because it bonds us together, okay? It connects us together at a very social, at a very basic level, okay? It facilitates mutual attention, okay? When I'm, when I'm talking, most of you are looking at me. And that's important for us to be able to coordinate our minds, for us to be able to bring our minds together. It also facilitates mutual attention through gesture, okay? This inner subjectivity, these mirror neurons, facilitate our uh, mutual attention through gesture. For example, okay, look, look at that. Look at that. Okay, look at that. Now, how do you know what I'm talking about? How do you know? Okay, gesture, I'm pointing. How do you know what I'm pointing at? My dog doesn't understand. <coughs> my dog, I say, look, over there, my dog goes that way. <laughs> my dog's not very smart. Some dogs are really smart, right? Like the, the shepherd dogs, mm -hmm. and the, the shepherd goes, shh, 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 and the dog goes exactly where they want them to go, right? How do you know? Finger, what do you do in your brain when Damon points? You see and you recreate my action in your brain, and your brain says, Oh, if you were doing this, if you were pointing this way, your attention would be on that speaker. So you recreate my action inside your head subconsciously, this is not conscious, subconsciously you recreate inside your head, and then you know what I'm pointing at. I'm pointing at a speaker. And this is very important for us to move from before language into language. Right? Think about children. Children, before they have language, always, often point it. Mm, mm. Or else they have other gestures. Mm, mm. What does the baby want? A hug. How did you know? Because probably when you do this with your hands, you want a hug also. Okay? We put our minds into other people. And this is, okay? And this is very important. Yeah, yeah, there you go. She needs a lot of hugs. Okay? And this allows for the physical coordination of meaning. How do you understand what this means? Because you feel the same way. The emotions that are active, again, me doing this, this is motor, right? This is motor, it's an action. But then there's also an emotion that is connected to it. How can you understand my action? Because you have very similar emotions connected with that action. And 
this then can lead us into language. Imitation and mutual attention. Okay, so we have imitation, mutual attention. Look at me. Look at me when I'm talking. Imitation. You, we copy each other. Along with gesture. These things taken together allow for the coordination of meaningful symbols. So now we can see this word, happy, and we can coordinate it, he is happy. I know that when I, when I smile like that, I know that feeling, that emotion that's connected with that behavior. And then these can be coordinated together with, into language. So that then when I say the word happy, your body, your mind, recreates the emotion and even the physical uh, expression of happiness inside your brain. So read many books about being happy, right? Com this is supposed to say confident. I can't I got things broke. Oops. Okay, this is supposed to be confident. What's his name? Tim Dong-hyun, okay. Confident, you, believe, you understand? He's confident? I think so. Okay? Probably because also is that, especially for the men, is that when you have that kind of posture, you are also confident. And that's the way we can understand things. But then also we can understand door. Okay? Again, I'm pointing. Door. What am I pointing at? Door. Okay? We're able to then coordinate our language together through our physical bodies, through our understanding. Screen. Screen. So we are basically finished. This is the end. And what this leads us to what's known as kind of a currently it's called a socio-cognitive theory, or I put here social cognitive theory, which is more of the psychology. Uh, this is this has been applied for EFL and ESL learning. Okay, particularly by um, a professor out of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. By Atkinson, okay, he has a socio-cognitive theory of EFL, ESL learning. Some things we need to remember: the foundations of learning are social. Foundations, the basis of learning is social. Language learning is always mutual. Do you understand mutual? Like two people or more. Meaning in language can only come from shared experience. If you never reached, you cannot understand other people reaching. Okay? But if you have reached, you can understand reaching. And then someone says, oh, I reached for the cup. You can understand I reached for the cup because you have reached. And you've seen other people reach. And we coordinate that together in the language. Okay? So meaning in language can only come from shared experience. Again, for example, I have a friend in America, okay, and I say Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay. He says, what is Yu-Gi-Oh? And I say, oh, Confucianism. He says, oh, Confucianism. Does he understand Yu-Gi-Oh? <coughs> no, why not? It's certainly bigger than just a word, it's bigger than just a symbol. He has never experienced Yu-Gi-Oh. He has never washed dishes during Chusa, <laughs> or spent hours preparing food for family, or he's never done Chesa, right? He doesn't understand. He doesn't have the experience to really meaningfully understand that language. Okay? Learning is an emotionally involved process. For us to learn, Emotions are necessary. Learning, especially language learning, always extends beyond the individual. It's not just inside of us. And I want you to all think. Think real quickly about school. What do we do in school? How do we, how do we learn in school? or testing for the, the assessment process. When we assess students, when we 
when we try to grade students, are we keeping in mind that it is social, that it's not the individual? Because the testing is all about the individual and about some kind of standard meaning or some sort of standard understanding of the world. But, but that's not the way that language and knowledge works. Okay, so I want you to think about these things, about testing, about the structure of our education system, and the way that it connects and matches or doesn't match our, the way that our physical bodies learn. Because it's always a social process. It's always a social process. Okay? Make sure that you write one question for Damon or for Joy at the bottom. You need to do that to get to get perfect points. 